Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Right, welcome to the Sabbath School section of our worship service. We will just zoom into our studies, and our study for today is Mission to the Unrich, Part 1. But before we pray, I would like to acknowledge those people who are present here in the pews. We don't have much people in here yet, but we're hoping that many will join us soon. And I also want to acknowledge those who are watching us online. We thank God that we are able to do that every Sabbath. But we also want to ask you to join us in person because we would love to see you and fellowship with you when it's possible. But we are also grateful to God that you are able to join us online as well. Shall we bow for a word of prayer? Daddy, we thank you so much for this opportunity to open your word and study the Bible. As we begin the study, we are inviting the Holy Spirit to be in our midst. Please come and bless us and anoint us. Your word cannot be understood by natural men, for the Bible says so, but if we have the Spirit of God, he is able to guide us into all truth. We need to understand your word and to live by this. But the power is through the Holy Spirit. And so bless us with the Holy Spirit today and let our minds be transformed by your word. This is a humble plea for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, so the, the, the caption for this week's lesson, which we are crowning today, is the mission to the unrest. Again, we've been studying about God's mission, our mission for the entire quarter. Now, wh when I was preparing for this, this study, I just, uh, upon reading the caption, I just asked myself, which group of people are classified as the unrest? And I want to bring this question up for discussion to take your views, even before we zoom into the lesson. What, which people are considered as the unrest? Because the, the, the study is requiring us to meet these people with a mission. But which class of people are we talking about here? We will discover that in Paul's times. I mean, Paul met the unrest. But before we do that, can we have one or two people comment on what the lesson is about when it talks about the unrest? Before we see Paul's example or Paul's demonstration of how to meet this unrest community. Yes, Cap. Luis want to comment. Good. Yeah, it's interesting because the lesson uh, started with talking about those who are within the church that are being you know, that are starting to bring in some pagan things and aspect of it. I love the part where he goes to Athens and he's finding individuals that they do not know about God, but yet they still had an altar, you right. know. So it's beautiful to be able to understand the way that he's trying to bring into your recollection that there, yes, there are individuals that are, are in reach all around you, mm. uh, even in your own community, but right. at the same time, you have to adapt to their way. You have to adapt. You cannot come in with authority, with, like, I love what he did in, in Athens. I know you're going to go through it. Right. That he came and he humbled and he spoke their ways, right. their language. They brought him down to say, hey, I'm not greater than you. I'm just bringing you our greater God. Right. Uh, and I think that's what this lesson was kind of trying to mm. let you know that in every city that he went to, even though the ones that he had to flee from, he still left seeds all over oh, in, the, in every area. And I'm hoping that as we start learning from this lesson, that we can do, we too can understand, that we can leave that seed. It's not our job to to water it or to, mm -hmm. you know, give it sun. That's, that's God's work that does that. Yeah. But yet it's our responsibility to, even without speaking, to be, to understand that there are others that are watching, that are looking, that are yearning, 
you know, and that's what I'm hoping that, that we have gotten out of this particular lesson, that right. yes, even though they are unchurched or unreached, uh, there's still opportunities for us to do so. For us to do so, right. Thank you, thank you, Luis. So I'll read the, the memory test, Acts 17, 24. It says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Does not live in temples built by human hands. Well, we're going to do a lot of discussion today, but I want to give a brief overview of what we have today to discuss. And so, like Louis said, upon entering a synagogue, Paul preached in very different ways than the one he used to when he contacted the pagans who knew nothing about Judaism. And we're going to read about that. And so presenting the message of salvation to those who already know Jesus, even if they have some doctrinal misconception, is relatively easy. And you and I can agree on this point. We use similar concepts, a common vocabulary, and we share Bible readings, people who already know about Jesus, relatively easy talking to them about Jesus because we have a common grounds. Yes. Now, however, reaching out to those who know nothing about Jesus or who reject Christianity entirely is more complex. And how do we reach such people? And so the unreached we are describing here, based on Paul's example, is people who know nothing about Christianity, who reject Christianity, who are totally into idol worshiping. How do you reach out to such a community or a group of people? And so that is what the lesson is going to focus on. And so while I put the lesson into these headings, we need to seek new fields for the mission. Just like you discussed earlier, Luis, our neighbors also need to have a share of our mission, people close to us. But apart from that, we also need to seek for new fields where the message has not been reached totally. Now, in such place, so this study is really focused on reaching out to people who know nothing about even Christianity. Now, in such communities, we need new ways of thinking. Paul exhibited this, and we are going to see that in his example, new way of thinking about the ministry. And then we also need new ways of preaching by adapting our message to suit the people. And we, so these are the areas we're going to consider. Now, the question we're going to see is how to evangelize non Christians. That is what Paul did. And so we first have to find common grounds, adapt our speech, and present Jesus Christ. Because the ultimate goal is to present Jesus Christ. But we need to have a new way of thinking about it a new way of preaching, find common grounds, and then finally, we can present Jesus Christ to our people. And so we'll go right into our reading, and we'll start from Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 17. I will skip the verse 1 to 15, and then go into 18, 16 and 17. Can anyone share this with us? Acts 17, 16, and 17. And we see the example of Paul in reaching out to people who has nothing to do about Christianity. Okay, yeah, Luis wants to. Okay, Acts 17, 16, and 17. It says, Now, while Paul waited for them at Anthem, his spirit was uh, stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, mm. therefore disputed 
Therefore, disputed he in the synagogues with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the matter daily with them that met with him. Okay, thank you, Luis. What do we see here? What is happening here in this contest? Paul is waiting in Athens, and he got provoked. So the, the New King James Version says his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. What is happening? And what did Paul do about this? And that is in the verse 17. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happen to be there. Can someone share with us what you see happening here and what method is Paul adapting and what we can learn from this? Any, yeah, Margaret wants to check. Thank you. I think sometimes uh, we can learn a lot from Paul. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think most of the times we right. can learn a lot from right. Paul. I agree. And this is one example, I think, where uh, we would do well to take heed. Right. Um, there's a saying, um, fools rush in where angels dare to tread. And um, Paul was no fool, that's for sure. Right. He yeah. went, he knew that this was a culture unfamiliar to him uh, in many ways. So he took time to mingle with the people, mm. to find out how they were thinking, to mm. listen, to get some ideas as to um, how, they, how they thought about different things. He studied their literature. He knew about their poets. Right. So he, he said, in order for me to do anything to help these people, I really have to get to know them first. Hmm. And he mingled in the marketplace. In, right. the, in the synagogue was easy enough because right. the people in the synagogue were of Jewish background or at least exposed to uh, Jewish ways of religion. Exactly. But the other people, he had to meet them where they were. And in right. order to meet them where they were, he had to go where they were, of course. Right. And he was willing to do that. Thank you, Margaret. So, yeah, he reasoned with them in the synagogues where the Jews were. Uh, I mean, the practical thing I see here, and the Sabbath school had discussed this previously, that we need to start the mission with our neighbors, people who are in common grounds with us. And so Paul started the mission in the synagogue where he could meet Jews, and they are familiar with Christianity. And so he started with them, but then, well, I mean, definitely the philosophers wouldn't come to the synagogue to listen to the message Paul is preaching. And so Paul reached out to them in the marketplaces. And I'm wondering if any of us have experienced preaching or sharing the word of God in open spaces like the marketplace, how difficult would that be? If any of us have that experience, it's more flexible. I feel that it's more flexible and comfortable speaking in the church, like preaching in the church, because we have shared common faith. But it becomes really challenging when you have to live outside your comfort zone in the church to go outside, especially the marketplace, to speak to people about Jesus Christ. And so it wasn't a comfortable experience for Paul, but Paul would not leave things without sharing the message of Christ. And so he would leave his comfort zone what he's used to, and go outside to preach. And so Paul used to come into contact with the Jews to introduce them to Jesus based on what they already knew about the Messiah. But in 18, he encountered a challenge, how to reach people who knew nothing about the true God. Studious people, and I mean, the, if you read a little about the 18, they are studious people people who are learned, they are philosophical thinking, they have this philosophical thinking, 
and are accustomed to worshiping hundreds of gods. How do you reach out to such people to talk to them about the only one true God? And so that was really challenging, but if you, if you look at the, the lesson, the, the, the verse 16, I will take it again. Now while Paul waited for them at the 18, his spirit was provoked within him. Paul could not stand seeing the city being given to idols. And so he would do what is a challenge. He would still go outside his comfort zone to speak about the true God. Now his intense desire was that they too would be saved. But how could he teach them the path of truth? How to bring them to Jesus? Radically different strategies were needed here. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul decided to reach the pagans using his own method. He had to adapt to a new way of thinking. If he spoke to the Jews in the synagogue like a rabbi, which he used to, he would sit with them like a rabbi, he would speak to the pagans in the city squares like a philosopher. The pagans are used to philosophers speaking to them and thinking through things. Paul adapted this strategy. And so he wouldn't sit in the church expecting people to come for him to be like, I mean, like a teacher teaching them like I'm doing here. He would rather reach out to them and reason. The Bible says he reasoned to these people. Now, I mean, Paul could not rest. His spirit was provoked within him. When we see people doing things outside God's way, worshiping idols, how does that make us feel? I think when we get provoked in our spirit, that is the only way we can be challenged to reach out, I guess. That is what challenged Paul to reach out because he sees people doing things which is not God's way, not worshiping the true God, and so he has to reach out and direct the attention to the true God. But it's really beautiful going to the lesson. Margaret pointed out how he carried the whole thing across. Critical thinking about how to reach the people with this message of Christ. And so he adopted new ways of preaching, and that is reaching out to them in the cities with Christ. Let's continue reading verse 18 to 20, if anyone wants to do that for us. We have seen Paul reaching out to people in the marketplaces and all over, 18 to 20. Anyone wants to share with us then? Uh, verse 18 of right. chapter 17 says, right. he also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Hmm. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he picked up? Hmm. Others said, he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. That's the New Living Translation. Right, right, thank you. What is happening here? What do we see happening here? Right, right. Mm. Mm. And so they would like to know more, isn't it? Yeah, they would like to know more about what he is trying to speak to them about. And so, and so the people said, you are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and would like to know what they mean. That is the verse 20. So after some time preaching in the square, the Athenians were surprised by the ideas Paul presented. And these are people who are seeking to know more. They are philosophers, so avid seekers of new teachings the Athenians wanted to understand more clearly what Paul was preaching. New gods, new teachings, strange things, things they never knew. 
about. And so what he said about God had nothing to do with the way they are unstable and vain gods acted. Let's note that. Accustomed to debating philosophical thoughts, they saw the coherence of their reasoning. And so Paul had to become familiar with Greek thought and culture. He had read the classical authors and walked the streets of Athens, carefully observing everything he saw and getting to know the way of thinking and acting of his inhabitants. And now the Holy Spirit was preparing him for a new way of preaching to people who were not used to hearing about the one true God. And so I guess we have to be very dynamic and allow the Holy Spirit to use us at different times than just being the same thing most of the time. Like, I've, I mean, truly, I've heard people preach the same message without any editing or like changing it a little bit to different group of people. I remember when we used to do evangelism in Ghana. We, I mean, you start preaching to people and they get bored, like, because I think the, the, the issue w- was with the method, I guess. I mean, upon reading this, I realized that we have to really spend some time to think about our audience, our, I mean, what they believe, what they already know, what they don't know, and tactically allow the Holy Spirit to use us to adapt new ways of preaching to reach new different groups. Because while Paul was used to preaching to Jews, people who were Christians, those who were not Christians, but when he came and, I mean, he had an encounter with these people, knowing that the whole city was given to idols, he had to rethink his way through. And so as he walked through the city, I mean, he confronted them in their marketplaces, and as he walked through the city, he was taking note of a few things that he could use to reach them. And so I'm not, I'm not sure the details of the message Paul was preaching in the marketplaces. I think that detail was not given here. But the fact that I mean, he aroused their curiosity and they wanted to know more, tells me that Paul was using something they know to come up with something they would want to know more about. And so we really need to think about what we share with people, know people we are going to share the message with, and allow God to use us to reach all class of people. Remember, we are, we are learning how to reach the unreached. And it's really technical if you want to reach the unreached. You really need the guidance from the Holy Spirit and you need to think through what you are going to do. Margaret wants to share a point here. <laughs> okay, Margaret first, then Louise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, thank you. Um, It's interesting, you know, that we don't have uh, an account of what Paul shared Mm. uh, because um, we do get a a fair idea of Peter's uh, sermon right after uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out. But uh, with uh, the writing Mm. here, Mm. uh, we're left to wonder, you know, really what did Paul share? But one thing for sure, Paul must have delivered it in such a convincing way uh, with enough uh, enough background about this God that they hadn't heard about before Hmm. that they wanted they wanted to hear more and I I, I'm given to understand that the the Areopagus or this high council building uh, was not something that was open to the general public and the very fact that it says they took Paul there meant that Paul was there by their invitation now. Mm. So that really, uh, I think some, I've previously missed the significance of this, but this was a high honor for Paul 
to be taken to the seat of the learned, exactly. you know, and to get an opportunity to share to with share. this elite group uh, what it was he wanted them to know. Wonderful. So uh, we know Paul was a very gifted speaker yeah. just by virtue of the fact that he received this invitation. Right, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Margaret, for sharing this. Beautiful. Okay, Luis. What I found interesting is the passion that he had. You know, and those are the things that we're, we need to bring out. We need to understand. We need to be, first of all, when he saw the sin, he was hurt in his heart. Exactly. You know, and how many of us, when we see sin around us, how many of us are hurting or how many of us are just excusing it? Oh, well, that's the way humanity is. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that he had is that he was, he was not comfortable exactly. along sin, what's happening with sin. But second of all, he was resolved. He wanted, he desired, he, he wanted to save this individual so much that not only did he come uh, to their places and he's talking to these individuals that are well-learned, he is coming and he is lowering his intellect to yeah. try to get to their level, to try to talk in their language, to try to talk with their slangs. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He right. didn't come with his mighty, you know, million dollar words. He came to his to their yeah, level yeah, yeah. and he started to to understand what are the things that we're in common with. And then he started working slowly mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. piqued their curiosity. And a lot of the times we, when we go to do Bible studies, we're so thirsty. We want to get that knowledge to them so fast. And I love how the pastors do it. They don't. They go slowly, and they pique their interest, and they leave them wanting more the next time. We, I go, and I want to get them, hey, here it is, the whole thing. And it's like, and, and it doesn't work that way. Okay, yeah, Pastor Steve wants to make a point. Oh, okay, Julian first, Juliana first. Happy Sabbath again, saints. Sabbath. Uh, <laughs> I, as I was studying the lesson this week, um, so many things came to my mind, and I saw Paul's approach as a good approach. And then I realized that um, sometimes we can misconstrue or we can, mis um, we can use it in a different way. Because having the knowledge of the idols and what is around us, do we now become a part of it in order to show that, hey, for example, this is not a popular thing, but now is the Christmas season. And how do we use this season to educate those who are out there that, yes, Christ was born, but December 25th is not his birthday. How do we portray it? Because being a part of the Christmas activities and everything that comes with it, are we really, really saying to people that Jesus wasn't born on December 25th? Because Christ knew about idol worship, but did he take it in his home? Did he take it out there? So when we are using Paul's method, Right? And saying it's the correct method. We have to actually look on how he used the knowledge that he had. Mm. He didn't become a part of it. And so when we become a part of it, we can no longer go and say this is not it. Because we are now part of it. Mm. And so as Christians, when we gain this knowledge, we have to use it the way Paul did. We have to use it to divert them from what is wrong to what is right. Right. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Juliana, thank you for sharing. Pastor Steve wanted to share too. Yeah. Yeah. Then we continue from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pastor Steve. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's something similar to Juliana said to us. Uh, it's because there are many opportunities to share to others uh, the gospel uh, mm. without remove our principles. And um, for example, Christmas, for example, Mother's Day or uh, Eastern, Eastern Easter. season, right? And uh, many other opportunities to share with people 
the gospel. Mm. But at the other side, there is something dangerous also. Uh, because the mix between paganism and Christianism produce syncretism. Mm. And that is the problem because during this Christian story, uh, history, Christian history, uh, for example, how we say, St. Augustine, is correct? St. Augustine yes. uh, introduced the Greek philosophy in the Christianism. And also in the Middle Ages, uh, Santo Thomas, Saint Thomas, Thomas, Saint Thomas, in, introduced Saint Thomas, okay. introduced uh, Aristotle as Aristotle taught in the Christianism. Mm. Mm. So uh, there is a battle, it's a fight about worldviews. Mm. So. But the, the, uh, in this uh, lesson, the essence is that we can reach people with our message, biblical message, principle message, uh, hmm. but in, how do you say, with clothes that the people can understand our message better. It, mm. an, exemp an example of this clearly is a missionary when the missionary England, England, England uh, uh, English missionary go to China, for example, mm. and they speak, speak uh, and the worship service was in the English, sty English style not many people was, were converted. Mm. But when, when the missionary changed even his clothes with China clothes right. and speak China, Chinese, then they produce yeah. better, better right. results. Right. So that is the, the point. Right. We need to keep and protect our message principles, biblical message, right. and um, to communicate in the language that the people can understand and mm. can love this message. Mm. Yes. Right. Please. Yeah, so I, I guess that is what makes the whole thing a complex thing, like reaching out to the unrich. Many times you need to go down to their level and then as you go down to the level, you have to be very careful not to compromise your faith. And so it, it's really a complex dynamic happening here. There's that tendency of you compromising some aspect of your faith because you want to just be seen as like them. And, uh, yeah, so it is really something I think Paul was really challenged about, seeing idols as he walked through the streets of 18, seeing idols, people worshiping and bowing down to them. He has, I mean, he wants to be seen as somebody who desires their good and who is part of them, but he wouldn't bow to the idols. And he's going to speak and draw the attention from the idols to God. That is really complex. And it needs new way of thinking and new way of doing things, new strategy of preaching. And the Holy Spirit is capable of giving us that ability to do that, if we are really prepared to do that. Yeah, sure. So we proceed with the reading, verse 22 and 23. So verse 21 says, for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So Paul is speaking, and like Margaret said, Paul has some depth of knowledge that people were drawn to. And when I was reading this, my mind also went to Jesus Christ. When Jesus starts to preach, 
or teach, people from far and near would come and sit to listen to him. And so if you remember when he fed 5,000 people, there were so many people who had come to listen to Jesus, no food, but they wouldn't even feel that they are not hungry. They will sit and listen to Jesus Christ. What is so, uh, I mean, I've been, I, I was asking myself, what is so special about these people that they will draw a whole lot of people around to come and listen to them? It also happened in the days of Peter, Margaret mentioned. People all over were drawn to hear their message that they were talking about. The same thing happened to Paul. And so people would not do anything but just to hear what Paul had to say. And now Paul has been invited to come to Areopagus, which to some extent was an honor. Margaret did a good job with that. Let's read from verse 22 to 23, if anyone wants to share with us. Verses 22 and 23. I also found an altar of this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Amen. What strikes you here? What is the message? What is Paul saying over here? And what do you feel is something we need to learn from? I believe there are so many lessons people want to discuss. <coughs> Yeah, Margaret wants to share. Yeah, yeah, very beautiful speech here from Paul. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there are lots of other people too who would like to to speak regarding this. Hmm. Um, Paul could have started off by saying, "What in the world are you doing with all these idols around? You know, they're made of stone or hmm. or." And, what, what, can, what help can they bring you? But no, he had nothing condemnatory to say. Right. He, commend, he commended them. You are a very religious people. Wow. You know, this, this is amazing. Wow. Obviously, your spirit is in the right place. You want to do the right thing. Wow. So it's always nice to start with a commendation. Mm. And then hmm. he picked up on this unknown God. And he said, you know something? This God that you don't know, I know him. Hmm. And I'm sure, <laughs> you know, that must have, that must have really turned Very their minds striking. around. Yeah. Wow. wow. Tell us more. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and <clears throat> so I see some similarities between this and then what happens to this uh, the, the woman at the wall, the one Jesus met, right? Jesus started speaking to the woman with strange things. And the woman was like, wow, how do you know all this? I, I, I think a similar scenario could happen in Paul's time where he said, I, I mean, you worship somebody to, to the unknown God, and I'm going to speak to you about that God. I know, I know him, I'm going to speak. I mean, they were like, what is happening? What message is coming? Like, there are so much and tools to listen to Paul. And so, going back to what Margaret just I want to reiterate the point that he started off by praising them. He praised the fact that they were religious people interested in spiritual things. At times, when people, we meet people and we feel they are on the right, wrong path, we seem not to see anything good about them. And I think that is really critical. I was trying to fathom what Paul, why Paul would praise them. Because everything about them was idolatry. And is there anything to praise about people worshiping idols? I mean, to, that, to the human mind, no. But Paul still found a grounds to praise them for the fact that they are people who love religious things. 
and three to our team. Okay, Caputi wants to Luis, right. I think that a lot of times this is something so important that we need to learn. Mm. Because as we're going in to do a Bible study, as we're going in and we're looking at all of these people that are in sin, the very first thing that we want to do, we want to start hitting them over the head yeah, of exactly. how horrible yeah. you're, you shouldn't be smoking, you shouldn't be drinking, yeah. you shouldn't yeah. be, and we never befriend them. We never get to the point to understand their point of view. Now, what I love with the lesson is study. When Paul started talking to those that are in the synagogue, he talked to them differently. He came at them and told them, hey, this thing's you're not to be doing. Now he's in, the, he's in the marketplace. Now he's in this amphitheater, and he's telling them, oh, wow, look, you have this God that you don't know. Let me show you. Let me start. But he started with love. He started with, with finding common things that he can talk about, mm -hmm. but at the same time understanding that there is some knowledge that they're not aware of. Right. And what we need to do is, like, I wish we had his sermons. I wish we understood how he spoke to them and the words that he spoke to them. Mm. But we can put between the lines, we can exactly. understand that between the lines. He was talking their language. Exactly. He was understanding and slowly. And now, now he gets to a point where he says, boom, I've got you. Exactly. I know something that you don't know. Right. And it's something that you are doing well because you are worshiping this unknown God. Right. But let me tell you, let me tell you a little bit about him. And that's probably the way Christ did. Mm -hmm. He used the same methodology. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm going to bring you something. I'm going to see you where you're at. And I'm slowly going to start building you. I'm slowly going to start molding you into mm -hmm. my likeness. And right. that's what I feel that this, that, that was happening at this right. time. Yeah, thank you. And that requires a lot of research to understand the people. Yeah, most of the time, I remember, we wouldn't do much research about People, we just go to them and try to prove to them that if you want, don't worship on the Sabbath. I mean, all those kind of stuff. But, well, so Paul wouldn't do that. He would appreciate what they are doing and then take advantage of that. Paul respected the people. He respected them. And so he didn't address them as an expert who was going to change their perception of the world, but as someone who wanted to share his knowledge as an equal. You have all the knowledge, but I also have something to tell you. And so the people would listen. He took advantage of common points. So he found in the altar to the unknown God a bridge that united both thoughts, right? And he did not mock their ignorance. On the contrary, he admired their desire to worship, even that which was unknown to them. So if people are willing to worship something they don't know, they will be more willing to worship a God that they can have an intimate relationship with. And so Paul wouldn't mock them. You are just worshiping idols, nothing. But he would rather take an advantage of that and show them that there's a God who wants an intimate relationship with them. And so preaching to people with beliefs radically different from ours it's a challenge that we must face with the utmost tact. With all due respect, we must look for points in which our conversational partner can be praised and even admired, and those that are common with our way of thinking or acting. And so verse 24, well, so verse 24 to somewhere 29, Paul started his preaching. And so I'll read from here, just so that you can read. And so, so verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, Though he's not far from each one of us, Paul is preaching to them now. For, 
For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Paul is even, I mean, quoting their poet. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these, ta- these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Beautiful message. Wonderful preaching. What can we see here? Yes, Louise wants to make a point. Well, the one thing that the major point here mm. is that he went and tugged their heart first. Right. He went and touched them in something that was common, and he now he revealed to them a mm. new God. He made them, he painted a picture of right. them of who this God was. Right. But then then he went right for the kill. You know what I mean? And I think that a lot of times we're so scared of that aspect of it when we're doing Bible studies. We're so scared of telling people, hey, you need to repent. You need to stop the things that you're doing, and you need to start following me. Mm. And I love Thursday's lesson, so I won't touch that aspect of it. Mm. But that's the main aspect of it. What's so beautiful about this, he started falling in love. He started sharing them and Mm. started bringing them to fall in love with this beautiful Mm. Christ, with this new God that they didn't know, this unknown God. And yet once he brought them to the place where he says, now that you're in love with him, okay, you have to stop being who you were, You Mm. need to repent, and you need to come and surrender to him. And that's where it all boils down to. It gets to the point because it's saying here, okay, yes, they are unreached. But that doesn't mean that they cannot be brought to God, but you have to bring them fully. You cannot leave them halfway. Mm. You have to bring them to the point where they completely understand who Mm. Christ is, and then they surrender to him. Either way, if you leave them anywhere away from that because you're scared of what they're going to say or how they're going to make you feel, then you have not done your complete work. Right, right. Yeah, thank you. So, Paul, we will just go through and we share what we have later. So, Paul found an interesting point to describe God with, and that was creation. So, okay, you worship an unknown God, but the God I'm going to talk to you about is the creator. And so, and I mean, everybody sees creation. I mean, creation is around us. So that was a good common point that Paul could just use something we all know to talk to them or to direct their attention. So creation is the common point that Paul used here. He presented the creator God and even used references to Greek poets to reinforce his thinking. So he might have read, whilst he was there, he might have read about some things they were writing about, because, I mean, these people are philosophers, so they write a lot. So once he had the attention, and Louis nailed that, he made a call to which they could now respond. Seek God. And it, it, it was very clear in his message that, okay, one second, you have done some things you didn't know. God is going to overlook that. But now that you know the one true God, you have to repent and seek him. Yes, you want to make No, I was just looking at Thursday there. Mm. And it says, uh, uh, I know you, you have to try to get them to, mm. to the truth. But once they come to the truth, they're not, a lot of people will not accept it. They will reject it. Mm. What do you do then? Just pray for them, I guess. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay, so, well, so huh? I, okay, Larry, go ahead. Yeah, and we know John, one of the apostles, he departed mm. from Paul, mm. and, and Paul was really upset, and really he didn't want anything to do with, with John anymore, but later on, you'll see as you keep studying the scripture that, you know, he said, 
send John Mark to me because he is profitable unto me. So you see Paul making mistakes, you know. Sometimes we can get ourselves into a big guilt load and where joy is zapped right out of us, you know. And, and we just got to watch things like the, the sister was talking about at Christmas. We just got to watch things and think about other people, not just by, for ourselves. Because, you know, like, I got a neighbor, he got his lights up, and I'd like to have mine up, because I like, like looking at the colored lights. I wouldn't care what time of the year it was. But, you know, we got to watch that we do not offend, and that's almost impossible today not to offend anyone. Pretty near impossible. Right. There's so much diversity out there today. And, you know, we got, we got to be wise in what we do and how we speak. Right. And just trust in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's got a part in this. And when the time comes, I can guarantee you, he'll put the right words in your mouth, and we will not have to worry about it. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, Brian, you kindly give us five minutes to wrap up. So, well, there's an interesting thing here on the Thursday lesson, like, so we do about that, presenting Christ. After Paul talking a whole about God, pointing the attention to the creator God and all that, he finds a way to bring in Christ. And so verse 30, 32, well, so verse 31, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in a righteousness, in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And so verse 32 says, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Well, so so the, I was going to ask a question that, well, so before the question, sooner or later the time comes to move from the common ground to new teachings. Amen. The foundation has been laid, very comfortable. People are happy to hear what is going on. Now Paul is bringing in a new teaching. After all, now, so interesting, after all, we achieve nothing by always talking about common ground. The Holy Spirit will show us the moment and the way in which we should openly present Jesus Christ. And so in his speech at the Areopagus, he spoke at length before introducing Jesus. When the time came, some loved, others preferred to talk continue talking at all. Some others wanted to continue talking at another time. My, now my, my question before, I mean, to wrap up the lesson is, Paul could have stopped with just introducing the people to this God who loved them, and they would have been quite pleased. But then he crossed a line that made people think he was deluded when he brought in the resurrection. Should he have done that, why or why not? I don't know if you have a question to that. I mean, so, sorry, time to digest this question, but probably I don't want to go off time, so I will just leave that for us to think about it. But the point is that the ultimate goal is to present Jesus Christ. And so whatever grounds we find ourselves, we can start from different dimensions depending on our audience. But if we only present on the common grounds, who cares? Nothing new to learn. But if we move from the common ground, which is kind of our comfort zone, to speak something new, which is Jesus Christ, people might seem not to appreciate in their faith value, but God would be praised. And God, will, the Holy Spirit will use that to touch their heart. Shall we bow for a word of prayer? Daddy, we thank you so much for such a beautiful lesson. We thank you for the life of Paul. And we thank you for the Bible that we can read what happened in the time of past. How we use, you used ordinary men like us to do wonderful and marvelous things. We are pleading that just as you inspired Paul to do all this, to reach the unreached, you inspire us the same so that we can reach out to people in, uh, in our close vicinities and even the unreached, people 
who has nothing to do about Jesus Christ. May we be blessed. We want to continue to commit the rest of the worship service into your hands. Pathfinders are coming up to lead. May you be with us and let our worship be acceptable in your sight. This is a humble plea for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.